Hi everyone, my name is Jim Carosa. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a former CRA board member, and also the former NSF size assistant director right before Margaret. Margaret, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. I'm really, really happy to be here today to be able to help moderate and facilitate this online session on teaching in the time of COVID. Now, this past spring, we just saw a massive shift really across the board from our online, from our in-class teaching to primarily and almost exclusively online teaching with prospects of this continuing on into the fall. Tremendous amount of creativity, a lot of hard work had to go into making this shift from in-class to online teaching. What we'd like to do in this session is we'd like to look retrospectively back at the spring of 2020, think about what were the challenges we faced, what were the lessons learned, and then look prospectively forward to the fall of 2020 and to think about how we may be able to apply these lessons and leverage off of what each of us have individually learned. So the way this session is gonna be structured is as follows. I'm gonna turn the floor over very shortly to three really tremendous panelists. They each have about five minute presentations. Then following that, we're gonna really open up the rest of the time for questions and answers. So I think you'll find this a really interesting session. Before introducing the speakers, I wanted to begin with just two quick observations. First observation is that even though we made a complete shift to online teaching in the spring of 2020, this was a path that a number of departments and universities had already been moving towards. For example, online master's degree programs or online aspects of introductory courses to deal with the challenges of scale. A number of universities have introduced the use of learning management systems and we see the increase in the number of MOOCs available. We see textbooks with online videos and we see professors taping material in advance in order to promote more active and engaged learning in the classroom. And so in some sense, the COVID pandemic has accelerated the move that a number of departments had already been making. I think this is a good thing to keep in mind. And the second observation is simply that there's a lot to learn and a lot to leverage from working together. We've got resources to share, we've got experiences, we've got lessons learned. And that's why we're actually here today, of course. I think there are questions of what are the mechanisms for doing this kind of sharing of experiences, and also what's the right level of granularity. For instance, are there lessons learned that are computer science wide? Are there ones that are very specific to courses, for instance, CS1 or CS2? And might there be issues that are related to specific problem domains like networking, for example? And I wanted to give folks a heads up that the SIGCOM networking community has an open workshop, August 5th and 6th. You can see the URL here on teaching in the time of COVID and beyond to actually discuss these issues within the networking community. It's open to all and you might find that interesting. So now it's my great pleasure just to turn the panel over to our panelists. You have their bios already, so my introduction here is gonna be brief. Our first panelist is Ron Liebskin Hadass. Ron is the R. Michael Shanahan Professor of Computer Science at Harvey Mudd College. He's also a member of the CRAE, and he's going to be talking about a survey that CRAE has done in teaching in the time of COVID. Our second panelist is Rachel Pottinger. Rachel's an associate professor at the University of British Columbia in computer science, and she's also the associate department head in charge of undergraduate studies there. And Rachel's gonna be talking about improving the interactions between students, professors, and staff. She's also gonna be talking about teaching across time zones and the workload issues. And finally, our third panelist, Jen Rexford. Jen is the Gordon Wu Professor of Engineering and Chair of Computer Science at Princeton University. Jen's going to be talking about staffing, about grading, and about how to create community online. Well, I know you're gonna be really interested in what Rand and Rachel and Jen have to say, so I'm gonna turn the virtual floor over to them now. Then again, we're gonna come back after their short presentations and open the floor up for discussion, questions, and answers. So as you're listening to them, keep in mind the kinds of things that you'd like to be discussing once we come back live. Thanks very much, Jim. My name is Ron Liebeskin Tadas, and I'll be telling you briefly about a survey that we conducted just last month of computer science faculty members who made the transition from teaching in person to teaching online as a result of the pandemic. There is also a link to the white paper that gives the results in more detail. That's available in your program. I encourage you to look at that when you have a chance. 
Uh, this survey was uh, designed um, and developed and ultimately analyzed by a group of folks. Betsy Bizeau at CRA did a lot of the heavy lifting here. Uh, the CRA SERP team supported us. Um, and in addition to myself, Nancy Amato, Susanna Hambrush, Jim Carosa, and Lori Pollock were all involved in this effort. The survey was conducted in June 2020 and asked computer science faculty members to reflect on their experiences transitioning from in-person teaching to online teaching when the pandemic struck, and also to think about their uh, upcoming teaching online this fall. Participants were recruited through an email that was sent to the CRA mailing list where we asked CRA department chairs to forward the survey to their colleagues and also to the SIGSI mailing list, a mailing list of computer science educators. We received approximately 450 completed responses. It's important to note that everything in the survey is about faculty perceptions, their perceptions of what transpired last spring and their thoughts about teaching online this coming fall. One of the questions that we asked was, what challenges do you believe impacted your students' performance when you taught online this past spring? Choose all that apply. There were many options to choose from, and there was also a category called other. Here, I'm just showing you the top few responses. Family obligations. More than 50% of faculty felt that family obligations impacted the performance of their students. Lack of sufficient internet, mental health issues, and time zone differences. A number of issues were evidently less prevalent, but we called them out here because we think they're important and quite impactful. Among these were lack of needed hardware, that is students not having the hardware resources that they needed to complete their coursework, financial insecurity, food insecurity, and housing insecurity. Housing insecurity came up as a free text response. It wasn't one of the options that we gave. We hadn't anticipated this one, but it's an important one. It manifested itself in both international students being unable to return home when the pandemic hit and students were asked to leave campus, and also domestic students who had complicated home lives at best and found that returning home was not the best place to continue their studies. And even though these are not as prevalent, um, their uh, impact is quite severe. And so we think it's important to be mindful of these. One of the questions we asked was, to what extent faculty agree with the statement that students learn about the same online as they would have in person? 37% of respondents either strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. 19% were neutral but the plurality, 44%, disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement that student learned as much online as they would have in person. To what extent do you observe academic integrity issues in this class? 45% uh, said none were observed. 32% said they were observed, but they were similar to normal circumstances. 16% observed more than normal, and 7% of faculty responded that they observed much more than normal. We also asked which, if any, features were actually better for your students online than in person. Choose all that apply. The highest were ability to watch recorded lectures at different times than class time, ability to watch parts of lecture more than once, ability to work at their own pace. 16% of respondents said actually nothing was better online than offline. We also made comparisons by the type of institution that the respondent was from whether the highest degree offered was a bachelor's, master's, or a PhD, whether it was public or private, the type of the course the instructor taught, a service course, lower division, upper division, or graduate course, class size in four different bins, the type of position held by the faculty member, either tenure, tenure track, full-time teaching, or part-time teaching, the number of years of teaching experience, one to two, three to five, or six or more, and whether or not the faculty member had previous online teaching experience, yes or no. With respect to support for students with disabilities, faculty who uh, taught at public PhD granting institutions perceived that their students had the most limited access to um, that kind of support. Students in lower division courses and service courses seem to be most impacted according to faculty. We also asked faculty members about the stress that they incurred in going from in person to online. Stress on faculty teaching lower division courses was highest and decreased with level. In other words, faculty members teaching graduate level courses reported the lowest increase in stress. Faculty with three to five years of teaching experience reported somewhat less stress than those who were newcomers, one to two years, or those who had been teaching longer, six plus years, although the differences here were not huge. Interestingly, the size of the class was mostly not related to reported faculty stress. 
we asked faculty members about the impact on student learning. Faculty with previous experience teaching online and those teaching graduate courses were most likely to agree that students learned about the same amount online as in person. It's not to say that they overwhelmingly agree that they learned as much online, but they agreed with that statement more so than faculty members who are teaching um, either lower division courses or had not had previous teaching experience online. Faculty teaching large courses were more likely to report that students learned about the same online as in person. We also had some forward-looking questions asking faculty members to reflect on their planning for this fall term and also their concerns. What will you do differently this fall if teaching online? Choose all that apply. There were many options here. Here were the five highest rated. More online interaction and discussion. Prepare more pre-recorded material. Refine, update course materials to increase independent learning. Redesign assignments and spend more time with students individually or in small groups. What resources will be important preparing to teach online this fall? Again, choose all that apply. Here are the five highest rated. Scalable methods for managing exams. Training on online instruction and pedagogy. Online teaching tools and software. Hardware, like tablets, cameras, and so forth. And assistance with making content accessible for students with disabilities. We also asked faculty members, what are your concerns about online teaching this fall? Choose all that apply. And here are the highest ranked responses. Keep students engaged with the material. Be aware of student difficulties, both academic and personal. Design effective assignments. Willingness of students to continue online. Ability to teach using best practices used in our regular courses. Maintaining our work-life balance. Creating comfortable and inclusive environments for students. And in the other category, where faculty members were invited to provide free-form text, it turns out that cheating was a recurring theme. We asked the question, what advice would you give someone who is teaching online this fall for the first time? And here we got all kinds of responses. And so here I've collected just a few of the representative ones. These were a representative of themes that we saw recurring in those responses. It will take much more time than a normal course. Be flexible, both with course policies and with deadlines, and be compassionate, both to your students and to yourself. Talk to people who have done it before and seek resources from your school and also online. Don't give long lectures. Break content delivery into smaller pieces. Use a combination of asynchronous and synchronous teaching, meaning presumably both pre-recorded material and also live. Practice using technologies in advance. Be prepared to deliver less material. Do a good job, but cover less content. Foster interactions between students, with TAs, and with the instructor. And then there were some positive uh, comments, things like embrace it, it's not so bad, be open-minded, and be okay with it being imperfect, because it will be. Well, that is the brief summary of our survey. Um, I encourage you to follow the link on your conference program for the white paper, which has um, more details. At this point, I'll turn it over to Rachel and Jen for their comments and perspectives, and then I look forward to interacting with you during the Q&A and the live session in just a short bit. I'm Rachel Pottinger from the University of British Columbia. For some context, we are a large research-intensive university in Canada. We have finished one term of summer teaching all online. All of our courses will be online in the fall. We have many international students, and we have a large number of TAs. One of the key things to take into account when planning to move courses online is that it's necessary to carefully plan out not only how to have the faculty interact with students, but how to ensure that communication happens between all groups in the course, faculty, students, and TAs and other course staff. When planning an online course, one of the distinct challenges is that having communication other than faculty to student or faculty to TA communication is harder to plan. Obviously, no one is saying that faculty communicating materials is not important. However, it's important to be intentional around all of the different interactions, and some of this is more difficult because of the online setting. For example, in a physical classroom, it's relatively easy to have small group discussions. The course instructor can tell the students to form small groups, and the students can fairly easily do so. After initial settling down process, students have a tendency to sit in the same spots in the classroom, thus forming their own sub-communities that they can use for ongoing support and social interaction. 
In an online setting, this is much more difficult and requires careful thought. Creating breakout groups is one way in which it's important to be intentional about this dynamic. The easiest way to create breakout rooms is just to create breakout rooms randomly. However, this will not allow the formation of cohesive groups. Formation of good networks for students needs to be considered when designing course plans. Similarly, many large universities have small group learning activities called labs, tutorials, recitations, or something else. For simplicity, I'll just refer to them as labs. There is an opportunity to design the class experience such that smaller groups can work. Such activities are often staffed by multiple TAs or can be more easily adapted to be arranged that way. Creating sub labs can make for better experiences for online students. For example, if your lab has 25 students and three TAs, instead of just having everyone work together, you can split the lab into three separate groups, each with an assigned TA. This allows for better interaction and communication for the students. A positive note of communication during online lecture is that while the faculty member is talking, TAs can answer questions in real time via text. We've discovered that this works well enough that we may attempt to recreate this when we're able to resume in-person instruction. Finally, make sure that TAs or students have a separate communication channel to the faculty in case of emergency. One instructor in my department reported that her audio was broken for a long segment of lecture, but she didn't realize it. Giving her TAs her cell phone number and keeping her cell phone out during lecture stopped this from happening again. Time zones are much more challenging when considering remote education, even if most of your students are domestic. In classes with multiple small group activities, it is relatively easy. Multiple sections can just be scheduled at different times. Large lectures, however, are more challenging. As convenient as it would be for some of our students to have lectures at 9 p.m. our time, finding faculty members willing to teach them, in addition to times that are convenient for our local students, is very challenging. Research shows that students will not stop the video recordings to do the exercises. This is a major problem since this is where most of the learning occurs. One strategy that has worked well for us is to have the lectures broadcast at a time that's convenient for local students and then have an experienced TA rebroadcast the lectures at a different time that's convenient for other time zones. This way, the TA can enforce breaks for exercises and questions, which helps the students to optimize their learning. Finally, as noted in Ron's comments about faculty concerns, all of these things are going to take more time. In addition to this, many faculty, students, and TAs are going to have additional challenges, such as additional caregiving responsibilities. This leads to a huge workload problem for all concerned. I believe that Jen is going to talk about this in more depth, but some things that have been done for enrollment challenges may be effective, such as grading online or doing frequent online quizzes. If possible, use staff or TAs to handle administrative issues. These are going to go way up. For schools that have little history of using TAs, hiring undergraduates to help can be a winning proposition for all concerned. But some things are just going to have to go. With that, I'm going to hand things over. I look forward to the questions and answers. I'm Jen Rexford, Chair of the Computer Science Department at Princeton. Uh, like so many of you, at spring break, we sent our undergraduate students home to complete the rest of the year remotely and are planning for a largely remote experience in the fall. In particular, at Princeton, our freshmen and juniors will be on campus in the fall and our sophomores and seniors in the spring. And we're compressing our academic calendar to start a few days early, end instruction at Thanksgiving, and have reading and exam period take place remotely for all students, whether they were residential before Thanksgiving or not. Uh, across campus, most courses will be online. Uh, some will be in person, although in our department, all of our courses will be online, in part because we're too large to offer uh, courses safely uh, in person and also for equity and health reasons. We just think it's better to, to offer a, a, a single experience for our students. But we're doing a number of things to try to foster online engagement for the students in our department. In particular, we're trying to increase faculty student contact by offering co-teaching of some of our larger uh, three and four hundred level courses. We're also trying to make the discussion sections in courses smaller to enable more interactivity uh, in video conferencing and to try to take more advantage of flexibility to have discussion sections at times that are convenient uh, for students in different time zones. And also because athletics in the Ivy League was canceled for the coming academic year, we have the some additional time blocks available to us that would not conflict now with, with sports. 
Um, and finally, we're trying to reduce the stress our students are experiencing by offering pass-fail grading for all of our courses, even for our concentrators who would be using them to satisfy their major. Now, of course, this introduces staffing challenges, all of the things I mentioned, and in particular, to have more faculty available to co-teach, we actually canceled a number of our graduate seminars, in part also because we suspect due to visa problems, some of our first year grad students won't make it to campus in the fall. And we also moved one really large undergraduate course from fall to spring in order to free up both faculty resources and graduate student teaching assistance for the remaining courses. Now, grad student teaching assistants are a particularly particular pain point because we want our discussion sections to be smaller and yet the visa landscape is challenging and also there's a cost issue of supporting a really large number of, uh, of teaching assistants. So we're increasing the role of, of undergraduate course assistants so that a discussion section might start with 20 students in Zoom and then break into smaller groups of say six or seven each where some might be run by an undergraduate course assistant who we feel will also add to the sense of connection among students in different class years, in addition to helping us staff the discussion sections. Because our grad students are, some are at risk of not having visas for the fall, we're assigning those students and to uh, spread out over a range of courses so that if they do get their visa, we're able to have them support our, our teaching. But if, if all of them are unable to come, no one course will be significantly short staffed. And finally, we're asking senior PhD students, postdocs, and, and even our IT staff to do some extra TA uh, in the fall to help make these discussion sections smaller. One challenge we have though that we really have no answer for is sort of dealing with uncertainty in the enrollment projections. Some students may not choose to stay enrolled in the coming academic year because of the virtual instruction. And we see unusually high enrollment in most of our courses more than usual, perhaps because students signed up for extra courses figuring that they want to shop to see which of those courses are doing a good job in executing on remote instruction. Um, we're also trying to find ways to create stronger community among our undergrads. For our graduating seniors in the spring, we had a sort of virtual class day ceremony that included you know, clips from uh, prominent alumni and, and graduating seniors. For the fall, we have a, a single faculty member who's responsible for coordinating our planning for the virtual fall semester, which is great for the faculty and, and students alike. And we've been having department town hall meetings to allow our undergrad students to understand what the decisions are that are made so far and to also get their feedback while, while answering their questions. Um, we're also putting together a set of invited speakers uh, in, in introductory classes to allow students to get a broader sense of career opportunities and exciting research going on in the field. And of course, as I mentioned, undergraduate course assistants and such to help both support their learning and to connect them with, with upperclassmen who might be mentors to them. And finally, we're trying to speak to other aspects of the current moment we're in, in particular issues around racial and social justice by offering some new independent work seminars for undergrads to do research on, for example, data science for social justice and supporting a new student group uh, looking at these issues around the role of technologists uh, in helping with social justice. And I'll just say in all of this, there's, there's one silver lining to the challenges we're all facing, that even though we're seeing a lot of challenges now, we've been grappling with some hard challenges of high enrollment over the last several years. And a number of the innovations that have been made there to help in teaching and grading and engaging undergrads and supporting the teaching mission are gonna come in handy, I think, for all of us in the months ahead and perhaps provide a way for us to help our sister departments uh, grapple with challenges that are even newer for them. Thank you and stay safe. Hi everyone, uh, again, my name is Jim Carosa and as the slide just said, it's now time for the live question and answers. And we've actually got 35 minutes or so actually for the live discussion. I wanna remind folks this is the first time you've been on the CRA main stage. If you look on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a place where you can type in questions. Um, and if you see questions that you really, really like to see uh, addressed, you can thumbs up them and um, uh, we'll start going through those. And, and I thought we'd start with the question that Sam asked about questions of equity. So how are you dealing with issues of equity and moving online teaching for instance, students with no or limited bandwidth, limited access to computers and such. So maybe I could, we could start with that question and ask the three panelists 
um, to address that both from their experience and, and what they may have heard, how other institutions and um, places are addressing that. So who'd like to go first? Yeah, I can jump in. I, I, I mean, the equity issue has many, many different forms. I mean, just to take the internet bandwidth as a particular one, the, the Princeton's handling this in several ways. People that have particular housing and, and economic precarity are able to be residential on campus, even if they're not in a class year that would otherwise be allowed to be. And they're providing financial support for students who are off campus who might have difficulty with their internet connectivity. But also more, more so, we can certainly uh, allow students to not have video turned on during lectures, to record lectures for watching later. And in particular, we found in the spring, a lot of students with poor internet had trouble during final exams. And one of the things our students have recommended is to allow them to take a take-home exam during any n-hour window, rather than to have to have continuous internet connectivity uh, during exams, and even allow them to potentially mail in their exams at the end, rather than rely on the internet for uploading them. Uh, for time zones and, and, and differences, of course, the recorded lectures help there too. And another equity thing we're doing is that even if students are residential on campus, any sort of pair or team assignments will still have to be done virtually, uh, partially for their own health, but also to avoid sort of disadvantages to students who aren't able to be residential on campus. And, and finally, making grading pass-fail optional for all of our courses so students with particular difficulty can elect that option. So I find that this is an issue that definitely has to have leadership at the university level, because something that happens in an individual department is not necessarily going to work well for everyone. So one of the things that we're fortunate in is that our university is offering bursaries for students who need additional funding in order to get computers or to have access to, to, have access to better internet. We are also leaving our on-campus housing open. So although people will not be able to be there in general, there are a number of people who can be there if they have issues that mean that they need to be able to access the, the information that they have. And that's something that's very helpful. On an individual course level, we are making sure, as Jen says, that when we are dealing with the courses that people are cognizant about the fact that yes, people's internet may go down. And so offering that ability for people to access course material outside of that core window. We also ran a survey where we asked students how much access they have. And so fortunately, thanks to that, we do know that the vast majority of our students have access to what they need to succeed, but we're very cognizant of this as we're moving forward. Yeah, I think this is a great question, Sam, and I've been thinking a lot about this too and taking notes from what Jen and Rachel just said. Um, I would just add that um, uh, like Jen and Rachel, we are writing to all of our students, both institutionally to find out what their needs are and also instru individual instructors are encouraged to do that, to try to understand what their students' needs are and try to make sure there's nothing high stakes that has to happen in real time because that's very stressful when internet is not reliable. Thank you. Wait, maybe if I could just follow up with a comment on a comment that Rachel made about needing to solve this at an institutional level, that fac faculty need to be flexible, but uh, if you don't have resources in the first place, the issue of equity uh, to, to access. In the SIGCOM networking uh, community workshop, a bunch of white papers came in actually about uh, teaching in the time of COVID in developing worlds. I noticed there are a number of schools are actually providing SIM cards for 3G and 4G access for students and just and people making the point that just like all students have the same access when they're on campus that the university should be thinking about people should have some kind of equity and access and that's part of a university's responsibility i think processes are clearly still evolving there because this happened so quickly okay um so let's see why don't we move on to the next question here and I'll read it out for everybody. Uh, this comes from, from Brian Noble. Hi, Brian. Um, and this has to do with assessment um, and especially the issue of student collaborating and, and cheating. And so it's got a lot of thumbs up there. It's obviously a question that I think a lot of people are wrestling with. So maybe if you could, uh, how about if we go in the reverse order of last time? Uh, sorry to surprise you, Ron. You want, you want to address that first and then Rachel and Jen? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Jim, and thank you, Brian, for that question. Um, this is a struggle. 
um, I had um, a higher incidence of these kinds of issues in the online portion of my course last spring than I'd ever encountered before in my 25 years of teaching. So I'm mindful of this. Um, but to be honest, I think for this fall, I've kind of gotten to the place of I'm going to set up the course in such a way that uh, there actually will not be uh, timed exams. Um, and I've just decided that I'm going to do my very best to convince my students that it's in their best interest to learn the material and do the right thing. And I'm not going to try very hard to suss this out because uh, frankly, it's really hard. And the emotional toll that it took on me um, was really severe in the spring. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a lot of students, it was just a couple of students. And frankly, I think uh, the way that I will set up my courses this fall will, uh, by omitting those uh, high stakes exams, I hope will reduce sort of the temptation to cheat. So that's, that's where I'm at at the moment. I note that we're having some technical difficulties. So I've been told to say that we're going to be right back in just a second. So just hang tight. Now ways to build in sort of that almost forced collaboration, but maybe with what you were saying about socially engineering that and applying a little bit of grief so it happens to Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so why don't we move on to, um, well, uh, Another question that's got a lot of thumbs up has to do with best practices for tests in uh, large classes. And again, this issue of teaching. So we, we did talk a little bit about uh, to mitigate the effects of, of, of cheating by creating low stakes, many more low stakes opportunities. But what about for large classes? Is that what you do for large classes? Just create a larger number of smaller things and avoid those, you know, there's a midterm and final type. So I'll go ahead and say that at the University of British Columbia, we are much more reliant on final exams than most institutions in the United States. We're sort of halfway between the US and the British system. So getting rid of final exams is not really an option for us. So we are still going to have final exams, but we are decreasing the weight on final exams. And then people look at various ways to deal with the, with the cheating. So one thing that people have done is to try to create multiple versions of questions. This is something that a lot of learning management systems have support for, and it works well, although of course it is more time consuming. So you have to be careful about that on the workload. Another thing that have people we have tried is working with various online proctoring. This has been um, a mixed success at the best. And I can think of at least two cases I know of both at UBC and somewhere else where things have gone disastrously wrong with that online proctoring software. So if you are considering to use this, you need to be very careful with being sure that the students and the faculty members are comfortable with what is going on because there are some real privacy concerns. But in a large classroom, you're not going to be able to do as, as much as you'd like. Some other things that people have tried are also just pulling out students into a breakout some students into a breakout and having a small oral component. So that way there is a way to sort of give a check and make sure that it's actually the student who's doing the work. Various things have tried. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullet, at least not that I know of. One of the things we've been doing in our large classes for, for a number of years is having undergraduate lab assistants that give advice on evenings and weekends, particularly on programming assignments and introductory courses uh, to help scale the support for that. And one thing actually that, that worked really well virtually is that the students could sort of get themselves in the queue to get to that kind of help. And they might be given an estimate of the wait time. And then they would know they would just continue to sit at their computer in their home doing work on other courses or on other aspects of the assignment, knowing when their help was going to become available. So in some ways, that, that was a case where, where the vir move to virtual was actually better because you didn't have sort of 30 students sitting in the hallway waiting for their turn at office hours. They, they were able to be perhaps more comfortable and productive with their time while they wait. And, and that's also been something that's been able to help increase the level of community in the second half of the spring term by allowing the students to interact with, uh, with the undergrad course assistants that way. Okay, um, uh, let's move on to another question. This one comes from Julie Kainz and, and Janet addresses a little bit of question that you raised or an issue that you raised earlier about teaming um, more senior students with more junior students. But her question is, well, what about students 
who haven't even been there before, right? And, and so this is maybe more putting on your department chair's hats and, and thinking of it more from an administrative, you, you have freshmen coming in, maybe you have students you know, also coming into a master's or a PhD program, many of them may be overseas. So maybe your thoughts on both at the undergraduate level and the graduate level uh, on this issue of working with students and creating community when the students have yet to physically put foot on campus or physically meet anybody. Yeah, that's a really tough one. I don't have a lot to say there because we're still grappling with it. But one thing we've done for the incoming first year undergraduate students is the student clubs have reached out to them ahead of time. And in fact, there already are volunteers over the summer, even from our not yet, in, not yet enrolled students who are looking for opportunities to engage in extracurricular activities, uh, even if virtually. So we're definitely encouraging our student groups to, to reach out. And we're looking into doing things like TA training and grad student orientation uh, remotely, because even, even our domestic students or non-first year students may not be physically on campus and may not be able to meet in person anyway. So at least our, our new first year students who might be remote will be in very much the same boat. And so whatever we do to create community for them will also hopefully help for the upperclassmen and, and more senior grad students as well. So when we have a number of things. Uh, again, we're fortunate enough that we already have some existing programs that are very helpful right now. So both at the undergraduate and at the graduate level, we have buddy programs. So this is something where we have the students have the ability to reach out. So we already have that, which is very helpful. Another thing that we're doing is we're being very careful about the email and making sure that we send out mail to students on a regular basis just so that they're kept in the loop and they don't feel like they're getting dropped off a cliff. And then there was one more, but I've forgotten what it is. So I'm gonna let Ron go ahead and say what he wanted to say. Okay. Um, so uh, in our intro courses, we our intro course, which every Hardy Month student takes, pair programming is a part of that. At least we have students do some of their work pair programmed. It's not mandated, but it's encouraged. And I think we're going to encourage it even more strongly this fall. Um, and we're also using a queuing system like what uh, Jen described, where um, students can come in and talk to our undergraduate TAs and help and with the instructor, of course, as well. And we're encouraging them to come together with their partner. Um, and we'll also try to encourage them to switch up partners um, at, least, at least once, if not twice, during the term. Um, to try to mix things up a little bit. Now, I'm not actually teaching the first year course um, myself this fall, but that's a conversation that some of us have been having about strategies to try to help with, with, with that sort of uh, acclimation to the new environment. Uh, so, so Ron and Jen, maybe I could ask you a very specific question that, that's already been, that's on our list here, and then maybe a more general question to all of you. The specific question is, what, so what software are you actually using to do that, you know, queuing and your estimated time to talk to somebody is so many minutes. So a specific question is, are there particular tools, actually for all, all of you, uh, are there particular tools that you would recommend? That's the specific question, especially with respect to question and answers. The more general question might be, what's the process by which this community can share that kind of information? But let's do the uh, specific question first. And, and maybe we'll start with Ron and Jen since uh, they did that and then Rachel, if you've got other pieces of software and you mentioned LMSs and randomized testing, for example, what tools have you found useful? Um, so the queuing system that we used was actually something that we homebrewed ourselves. In fact, on his own initiative, one of our undergraduate TAs just came up with this like over spring break, just as we were transitioning to online and he provided it. Um, so it's currently it's an in-house one, but I understand that there are others. Um, I have had some students who are doing research with me this summer who come from other campuses and they told me that there are some third-party products. And it's a good question. We should think together about how to share this out, these kinds of technologies. Yeah, we have a number of homegrown systems, both for the queuing that I mentioned, as well as the hiring of undergraduate lab TAs and, and graders. So a lot of things are homegrown. I mean, there's certainly more community resources for for grading, things like Gradescope, for example, that we've used in Piazza for, for having an online forum for the class. But Jim, you bring up a really great point. It'd be lovely to have a, a clearinghouse for open source software in this space, as well as pointers to you know highly recommend. It. Back to that clearinghouse question. And, and let me just say to, to both of you that if you've got homebrewed code and you're gonna put it on GitHub, then all of a sudden you're gonna have a support function you're gonna have to Indeed. So Rachel. Right, so we have done a number of things. So the learning management system that we use is Canvas and there is an integration with Collaborate Ultra. 
And I know that a number of different faculty members have tried either doing Zoom or Collaborate Ultra in order to do queuing for question and answers, and that's worked well for a number of people. A number of us also use Gradescope and have found that having already done that has been a big plus. One of the things that we also find though is that everybody is different. So, you know, one person likes to do randomized exams by having a whole bunch of shell, having a whole bunch of shell scripts and a bunch of different PDF hacks. So one of the things that's been important for us is that we created a Slack workspace. It already existed, but we sort of co-opted it as a way for people to talk about here are the kinds of different teaching things that people are using so that we can share that information. And you can imagine it would not be my job, but someone might want to go ahead and do something like that for the community as a whole in order to just kind of share these best practices. Right. So, so let me, speaking about best practices, let's come back to this more general question. Do folks have thoughts on, um, I mean, this is a question that absolutely everybody's going to have to address about, you know, queuing for questions or, you know, which particular LM, LMS might help you with this or, or whatever. How do we as a community share that information? Or might we share that information? Other than like a broadcast email. <laughs> Yeah, so again, I, like I said, we, we have a Slack channel for the department that works very well. And when I was one of the general co-chairs of Sigmod, we also had a Slack, a Slack workspace there that was surprisingly engaging. So I could imagine that this would be this kind of thing where there's asynchronous communication that people can go in and it's low weight, something like that for the community, I would imagine might be very beneficial for everyone. Uh -huh. Okay. I see nods. Okay, great. Um, we, we've got three or four questions that are broadly on the topic of teaching assistance. And um, it has to do, so we're asking our, just listening to the three of you, it's very clear, your teaching assistants are doing different things in the spring than they did in the fall. And they'll probably pass fall. And that will probably proceed forward. So there's an issue of training TAs. Uh, there's an issue of them just doing different things. There's an issue of maybe not having as much support for TAs. And there's an issue of TAs not having only to do different things, but maybe having to do more things. So I think there's a whole broad set of issues around um, uh, teaching assistance. And there are a number of questions that people have posted. So maybe we could pick up that discussion thread. I can jump in on one thing there. I mean, one challenge we have is that we would like to have more TAs in the fall because we obviously have a bigger support function. We want to have smaller discussion sections. And yet it's both a financial barrier as well as finding qualified people because we don't necessarily have the ability to create new grad student TAs. And if anything, the visa challenges might mean that we have fewer than we normally would. And so definitely undergrad course assistants are an important piece of the puzzle. And we're thinking of in, in large classes having discussion sections of the normal size that start out and then break into groups of maybe one third the size where a couple of undergraduate course assistants play a role. And so we're literally even just today posted an ad to hire those undergrad course assistants. And we're hoping it's also a way to help us build community. Um, and and, and by, by training those students, they'll, they'll hopefully get some faculty time and mentoring from us, and then they in turn will be able to be mentors to students junior to themselves. So it's not a panacea, but the only thing that scales with the number of undergraduates these days is the number of undergraduates. And so it seems that they have to be a piece of the answer. Rachel or Ron? Sure. So we have a large number of undergraduate TAs, hundreds of them every term. And as such, we've already had to have TA training. This is something that's mandatory for the TAs and we're fortunate enough that this is something that's well scheduled. So now we're working to make sure that this information is being moved online so that they have training with the kind of tools that they might, that they might use in general, as well as being familiar with some of the scenarios that we were talking about, about understanding that students are going to be feeling more isolated, especially the new ones. So one of the other questions that I noticed that was on there was how are you dealing with the potential decrease in the funding for TAs with budgetary cuts? And this is something that we have not yet seen, but like many places, we are concerned about the number of TAs that might have visa issues or other sorts of issues like that. So, so far we're, we're doing a watch and see approach, but we're lucky that this is something that has not yet impacted us. I'll just uh, add very briefly that I think consistent with some of the experiences that perhaps uh, Rachel and Jen described earlier, um, 
This past spring, a number of my students said that they actually found that TA access was better <laughs> online and offline, in part because of these um, queuing systems, but also because they could make appointments really easily and they could just like, um, it was, it was different from, you know, 30 students showing up to a TA session and trying to fend for themselves and get to the front of the line. And so particular students who are less assertive, I think, found that by just scheduling a, a time with the TAs, um, they actually got better access. So I'm very optimistic about that. And we're going to try to make sure that um, we do this in, a, in an equitable way. The, the, the issue that we're grappling with at the moment is uh, we're in California and um, it's not clear whether students who are studying online but not in California can actually be hired to work for us. So we are panicking about that, but we decided to wait on panicking for a little longer and then we'll see if we have to do something really creative. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be okay. So I have to say you, you, you all painted a pretty rosy picture of, of, of TAs and, and also using undergrads, I'll say, to sort of scale peer to peers to help, help, help each other out. Um, so that's great. Um, would, would any of you, so there was a comment about the increased load on TAs. Would you agree that it was either harder or more work to be a TA or is everything really all roses, at least on the TA front? My, my TAs told me that um, they, they actually rather liked it um, online. Um, obviously, the, the, they, they missed sort of the, the human dimension, which is like, that's a, that's a huge loss. There's no question about that. But I think they felt like it was easier for them to say, I'm, I'm going to work with you for 10 minutes. And then I'm going to let you think about this. And I'll come back to you in a while. It was easier. <laughs> it was just easier interpersonally to make that break electronically online than it was actually in person. Um, and so I think that was helpful to them. I think also another issue that RTA sometimes confront is when a lot of people show up for help and they're all in different places on the say the same homework problem. Um, it's very, it can be awkward for them to try to give people hints or give people help when other people might overhear it who are not in the same place. Um, and by doing using electronic media and particular breakout rooms, they were able to manage this much more effectively and they felt actually more comfortable with being able to work with students from where they were at at that moment. Yeah, I completely agree with Ron. We had the exact same experience that the sort of virtual TA had that advantage. You didn't have a, a cohort of 30 students trying to find a chair for each one, feeling flustered while you have a crowd of students around you worrying about them overhearing. Of course, you miss something in that, but I think it, it ended up being in some ways, ironically, a little easier to manage than, than the in-person format. Okay. Uh, so, so let's move on to another question. We've only got about five more minutes, so uh, we'll probably only be able to take one or two more questions. So if folks have a last minute question or there's one they'd like to highlight so it floats to the front of the most numbers of votes for un, uh, unaddressed questions, please take a look at the questions. And, and this one comes from uh, uh, Magda Balazinska. And, and her question is broadly about um, checking in with students, I guess, maybe one way to put it to talk about making sure that we understand how our students are doing. So I'll read her question. Um, and it's looking specifically for activities that can help keep an eye on how well students are doing from a mental health perspective and support them in that way. So um, one thing uh, that I, I learned this past spring is when I had concerns about a student, not only should I reach out to them, but I should really reach out to my Dean of Students office. Like generally speaking, I was reluctant to, I've been reluctant to do that. I try to keep that, I try to, you know, not, not go to the Dean of Students too easily. Um, mainly, you know, just for the sort of uh, confidentiality. I mean, I'm not breaking confidentiality by any means, but I did become more inclined to reach out to the Dean of Students when I was, had, was concerned about a student. And I think our Dean of Students um, was um, happy that faculty were doing that. It wasn't just me, other faculty were doing that too, because the sum of a few epsilons ends up adding up to like a, a more serious and clear picture of what's going on. So if several faculty are even modestly worried or moderately worried about a student and the Dean of Students hears about that student from several different places, I think it makes it easier to understand what the issues might be, bring that student in, try to get in virtually um, and have a 
conversation with them. So I guess my advice would be, um, if your campus has uh, resources like that, hopefully they do, then I would uh, try to take advantage of them and ensure that you communicate with the folks who are watching out for the student side. I think this is a great question, and, and I think that I think having there be more than one faculty member who's able to to check in on a student is certainly really helpful. So, I mean, if each student has an academic advisor, the instructors in the courses that they're taking who are hopefully tracking which students are behind on assignments or doing poorly on assignments, and if the students have to do an independent research study, which our concentrators do, their independent work advisor becomes another point of contact. And so I think the real challenge here is that the faculty are overwhelmed as are the administrative staff as well. And so all of us know we should be keeping tabs on the students and checking in on them. And there's some risk that that happens less well than it would normally because of, of the faculty and staff being themselves pretty overwhelmed and stressed out. And so I think that probably will require more, more proactiveness at a department level to make sure people do make those check-ins periodically. So I'd like to build on what everybody else has said and say that if your university does have any sort of a system, like the one that Ron was discussing, where you can propagate up small pieces of information or in order to get a bigger picture about what's happening with a student, I think that's gonna be really important to make sure that people are using this because this is something that more students are going to have more stress. One of the other things that can happen is that because the faculty members are going to be more stressed, again, I think that this is a great place to use TAs. So TAs often have more individual interactions with students. And this is where a lot of my information about students who are struggling happens is from the TAs. So as you are having your TA meetings, make sure that the TAs know that this is something that they should definitely be bringing up. And finally, assigning a TA in order to keep an eye on the overall grade book and just point for those students who are having trouble can mean that then there's someone who's, it's their job in order to look after that rather than it being something that's going to slip through the cracks. Because we all have so much to do that if we rely just on the faculty member remembering to do it, chances are good it's going to get messed. Uh, okay, so I, I, maybe I'll just uh, make one comment at the end of that. I wanted to come back to something that, that Rachel said earlier about communication. I think one of the things that faculty probably really need to be uh, um, uh, aware of is how important it is to communicate, communicate regularly, and also to communicate that you're really open to students you know, coming up and when there are issues, bringing up those issues, right? I think, and that probably especially true for new students and probably especially true for new overseas students who may not be used to faculty sort of being able and, and, and willing to take on that role. So the communication aspect, especially at the beginning of the course is probably, probably crucial. Okay, um, I think maybe we've got time for one more question um, and I'll make it a combined question and you can address either pieces of this. There are a couple of questions. This is going to pedagogy asking about um, ways to do active learning, again, to engage students uh, in the class. Um, and the other question is about asynchronous versus synchronous. And that I think implicitly in a lot of our discussions here, there's been an assumption that these are synchronous discussions and, and synchronous meetings going on. What about uh, asynchrony? And, and maybe we'll make that our last question and we'll go right around the room. Maybe we'll do Ron, Rachel, Jen, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that really good question. Um, so let me just say, I don't have enough experience to say that, what I'm, that I know how to do this right. But um, based on you know the few weeks that I had in teaching this past spring and conversations with colleagues, what I have come to is um, that asynchronous is really desirable, in particular if you have students who span many time zones, well, probably most of us do. Um, one thing we saw in the survey of faculty is that faculty perceived that one of the few advantages of being online was for students to be able to watch classes, watch material being presented at their own pace, um, and to go through the material multiple times if they wanted to. Um, and so that was really advantageous. So my, uh, my, my inclination is to do that. But I've also been told by students that if they're not held accountable, then for watching those things and they won't come prepared to the in-class sessions and so they asked please hold me accountable and so the mechanism i plan to use for that um, is having sort of mini quizzes very low stakes basically did you watch that video um, can you answer a few basic questions about what transpired and since they're not really homework 
set kinds of problems. And then they're expected to submit those before they come to the in-class Q&A. And that will account for a small portion of their course grade, but it's really low stakes and low pressure. It's mainly intended for accountability. And then in class, my hope is, and again, I, I do the luxury of having relatively small courses, but um, to have a short welcome plenary um, where there's some Q&A with the entire class and then going into breakout rooms and I and my TAs will walk through those breakout rooms virtually and interact with groups of maybe two, three, four students at a time for just a little bit of time. Great. So that way you're mixing both the synchronous with the asynchronous and you're using the stuff that you prepare ahead of time to lay the groundwork for doing more active um, activities, for lack of a better word, when you have all the students together at the same time. Indeed. And worth mentioning, by the way, that there will be some students who won't be able to attend those uh, synchronous sessions. And so it's also, we'll make it very clear to them that if they can't do that, they need to let us know and we'll find some other accommodations. And um, we'll record the plenary part at the very beginning and we'll find some other alternatives for them to do those exercises. Yeah. Well, maybe in, in the, uh, you know, in the sharing mode, I'll say that I, I read a great book recently called Small Teaching um, on my bookshelf right over there. Um, and there's one, one of the two of those actually talk about uh, small teaching in the context of teaching online. So it's how to bring things actively online. And so that was recommended to me by someone who runs a, you know, faculty teaching uh, activities at UMass and I recommend that to other people. So let's move on, Jen. Yeah, I don't have much to add, in, but I, I think what we're, we're trying to do is, is give faculty some autonomy to decide whether their lectures are synchronous or asynchronous. And faculty have picked a mixed, uh, mix of options, but even the ones that are synchronous will be recorded for students to watch later. Uh, but, but the discussion sections, we're really expecting those to be live, to be able to provide the smaller group setting with real engagement. And, and there, we're going to try to offer them at lots of different time zones, both to accommodate students in different locations and also for students who, for whatever reason, have to miss their regularly scheduled time to have a second opportunity for some real you know, live interaction that hopefully can facilitate their learning. Okay. Rachel, you have the last word. Woohoo! So I'm a big fan of breakout rooms for active learning. And one of the things that's important is to realize that this kind of switching back and forth can be very tricky to manage. When you're doing it in person, you can kind of switch back and forth on the computer, but it's something where there's a lot of coordination involved. So one of the things that needs to happen is that faculty members need, again, a spot to spare breath. To, to share best practices and discuss the things that they're going to use. How, what software are they using? What kind of things are happening? But the breakout rooms can really manage to make sure that the students have a chance to actually do that active learning, which is so crucial. And this builds again on something that Jen mentioned at the beginning, where that some of the things that we have been doing already, and also building out on what Ron said, some of the things we have been doing already in order to manage the scale, like the practice of having quizzes on the, as the asynchronous component before you get to the synchronous, really are going to, to hold us in good stead. So I think between trying to make sure that as much of the lecture time can be as active as possible, and then also making sure that we're continuing on those best practices of doing some sort of way to motivate the students to do the work ahead of time is really the way to go. Okay, great. So I think with that, it's, it's really time to, to wrap up this panel. And I wanna thank you all for the production of those great videos that we started off with, but also all the uh, insightful conversation and discussion here, thanks to everybody uh, who's been participating in this with all these great questions that have really um, created all this space for, for, for great discussion. So, uh, so thank you all. I hope we'll find a good way, a Slack channel, uh, Rachel, however we end up doing it, but as a community to continue the discussion. So um, thanks again, and um, we hope uh, we'll, we'll be back at, Ron, I think you know the schedule better than I do. We're going to be back in. We have, we have, we, we have, a, we have a break, and then uh, the next thing is strategic planning. This okay. Yeah. See you back at the strategic uh, planning. Sounds That's good. Right. Bye. Bye.